But I think the McKinsey report does. It puts some numbers to what we've been observing over the last number of years. Africa is the success story that is undersold. Recently, there was a, <clears throat> a very interesting um, collation of data on economic growth. And it looked at the 10 fastest growing economies in the period 2001 to 2010. And I'd like to ask you, if you had to guess how many of those economies were in the African continent, and if you had to play the game to put a number to a piece of paper, what is that number likely to be? The answer, of course, is six of the ten fastest growing economies in the world over that decade was on the African continent. It's a very important uh, realization that it's not just opportunity, it's happening. Over the next five years, using IMF uh, uh, data and excluding economies with less than 10 million people, seven of the fastest growing economies uh, in the top 10 in the world uh, is projected to be on the continent. So I think the challenge for us is to think what do we need to do to ensure that we enhance that growth, that we capture more of that growth for the African uh, people, and that we make that growth sustainable. And I'd offer five brief observations on the fundamentals. The first is clearly infrastructure. This is a continent, as uh, uh, Minister Gordon uh, mentioned in his introduction, uh, that doesn't really trade with itself. And I've got a map that we show around <clears throat> in our roadshow in South Africa of the railway lines on the continent. It's a fascinating map. Because here you have the pear-shaped continent, and you have railway lines that essentially run to ports. And there's a missing middle. No connection. The railway lines are not integrated. They're not designed for a continent to economically interact with each other. But transport, important as it is, it's not the only infrastructure challenge. It's energy, it's communication, uh, and important to unlock more of the agricultural opportunity is water. The second challenge I would suggest is, is one that flows from the observation on uh, uh, infrastructure, and that is strongly promoting intra-regional trade. But it's not surprising that roughly 12% of Africa's total external uh, trade is with, its, uh, with itself, whereas uh, in the case of, of uh, developing Asia, if you take Japan out of the figures, it's close to 50%. There's not much sense in countries trading with each other if we mine platinum and you mine copper. The trade has to be based on building an industrial base. And that's the third fundamental, is to get our industrialization strategy right. We can't only be uh, growers of food and diggers of minerals. We've got to be able to grow Africa's manufacturing capacity. And that provides the incentive for greater interregional trade, greater beneficiation of Africa's uh, uh, natural resources on the continent, creating jobs, creating quality jobs, and trading confidently with the rest of the world. The fourth one is skills. And I would emphasize what has been said on skills development. Paul mentioned uh, earlier the need to promote more lawyers, accountants, and financial modelers. I think there may well be a case for that. But what we're driving now is a program to grow African engineers, African artisans, African technicians to really provide the human resource capacity for this industrialization strategy. Let me go back to the McKinsey report. One of the really interesting things, interesting numbers in there was the growth of the consumer goods sector, consumption. Uh, it's uh, currently, two years ago, it was about $860 billion US dollars. It's projected to grow to about 1.4 trillion US dollars. That's a growth of more than half a trillion US dollars in the size of the consumer market. 
And so we've got to invest in being able to tap more of that potential on the continent. And that's going to be your human beings, your infrastructure, your industrial base. And then finally, it's important that we attract foreign direct investment from outside the continent, very, very important. But we've got to also enhance Africa's own savings space, the domestic savings space, and build up a stock of capital on the continent that is increasingly deployed on the continent. The South African companies need to invest elsewhere on the continent. Uh, it makes good business sense, but it's also good strategically in the long term to grow other economies because a growing uh, uh, African economy with its one billion uh, consumers is the best long-term foundation for our own growth on, uh, in South Africa and in our support uh, to uh, the rest of the continent. I mean, if you look at the next five years alone, uh, the African countries that will be in the top 10 make for very, very interesting reading. They include Tanzania, Congo, Ghana, Zambia, Mozambique, Nigeria, and Ethiopia. Very diverse. This is over the next um, uh, five years, 2011 to 2015. In the past 10 years, Angola's growth in fact exceeded that even of China. Very, very interesting. I mean, this is uh, an important story that we're not telling. So using current projections, I think you're seeing a very diverse range of countries. They're not all the same. It's not just your um, well-endowed mineral resource economies that are taking off. It's an it's a eclectic mix. Now, as we position South Africa for the African continent, investors sometimes tell us, why don't you tell the South African story more clearly? Why always the African story? And I think it's from the realization that the South African story is only sustainable in the context of a larger African story. Consider yesterday the Russian president announced that South Africa has now been invited to be one of the BRIC members, and in future you'll be calling it BRICS. We've got 50 million people in South Africa. Brazil has got four times as many. India's got a billion people. China's got 1.3 billion people. So where's the source of growth for the South African economy? It lies on the continent. It lies on the continent. So we've got to tell that story and we've got to integrate. Now, some of the constraints in doing that is infrastructure. So one of the practical measures that, that we're looking at now is to propose to a few uh, uh, countries, five countries, an initial pilot partnership to set up what we call a smart ports strategy, where we identify five ports, including one South African port, where we can invest in a common infrastructure, a common ICT and regulatory uh, arrangement, some common HR, human resource uh, arrangements, you know, common management, uh, cross-training of people and so on, so that we can play to the advantage of our long coastline. So coming back to your question, the more specific question, which countries, I think it's a wide number of countries. But let me say the experience from, from Europe is also instructive, that you've got to have champions. Um, uh, it needed the Fr uh, French-German partnership to drive European integration. And later, uh, other countries were, were very important. Mm -hmm. Without limiting the number of countries in any way, uh, Nigeria is going to play a critical role in uh, Africa's integration, as is Egypt. Uh, Angola is also a very important player uh, in, in, in these efforts. So we can't do it alone as a country. We need partnerships. Uh, these are some of the partnerships. They're not the only partnerships. And, and it's, it's that story that I think we okay. want to tell. Doing business in Africa. You can't afford to be without Africa Investor.